Um, so just to give you a quick introduction of Peter, um, he's one of us in the sense that uh, many years ago he worked in LUSAT. Yes, that's right. Along with uh, other famous alumni. Uh, and he's currently the project controller for the Future Missions Office under the Science Program at the European Space Agency. So it's fantastic that he's able to come along and talk to us today about um, Cosmic Vision 2015 to 2025. Yes, that's, and amongst other things. Amongst other things. So um, please welcome Peter. Great to be here. So I'm normally based in the Netherlands. I'm just out here visiting my family. So uh, it's good to, that uh, there's so much interest in the space industry uh, in Australia. So very much appreciate the, uh, the opportunity to speak to you today. So I've got a bit of a, I have quite a lot of slides. Uh, there's some general information about ESA, and then I've got some of my own experiences mixed in. I've been with ESA now for about just under eight years. I've worked in various roles, I'll give you a bit of a summary and maybe at the end of this, the presentation I actually have a bit of a, a background of how I ended up there. It was a big call. I'm actually not an engineer by trade or a scientist. I did do some science at UNSW, very unsuccessfully I might add. Uh, I uh, finished with a commerce degree, so I'm oh, oh, oh. Please don't hold it against me. <laughs> so I, I'm actually an accountant by trade, which is a very unusual sort of uh, background. There, there are plenty of accounts at ESA, but not nearly in terms of uh, compare against the engineers and the scientists. So I'll kick off. It starts with some quick facts about ESA. So uh, you'll see the, the front slide I had to mention that it's our 50th anniversary. So uh, ESA came together with a combination of two organizations, ELDO and ESRO. One was the science organization, one was the European Launch Development Organization. Now, uh, ELDO was quite significant for Australia because of course, they use Woomera as their test site. So if you ever get a chance to go to Woomera, I thoroughly recommend it. I went a few times when I was still living in Australia. And of course, that was the start of the European launch program. Fortunately, the Australian side of things was discontinued, and France continued their development and their testing up in South America, in the French Guiana, French territory there. I'm going to mention that a little bit later. So we have 20 member states. We're not a body of the European Union. So we actually represent the countries directly. We do work with the European Union, we have some cross-funding, but essentially uh, our funding comes directly from the countries, from the 20 member states. And our total budget there, you can see, is quite substantial, 4.1 billion euros a year. We have a uh, significant uh, flight history, uh, number of scientific uh, crafts still in operation, as well as uh, ones that have been retired. And of course we celebrate our 200 launch of the Ariane launch people. So here's a bit of a, a very broad description of what the agency does. So we're a civilian agency, we provide for and promote the exclusive peaceful purposes, cooperation amongst European states in, the space, in space research technology and their space applications. So that's sort of our underlying, comes from the EASA convention, a little bit about how we were formed and what we aim to do. Okay, that's a little bit of a summary of the member states involved. So we actually have uh, a lot of EU states as well as a few non-EU states like uh, Norway and Switzerland and cooperating uh, uh, partnership with Canada. So, which is of course unusual for the European Space Agency uh, that Canada is one of our participating states in some of the programs. And it's, uh, it's good that uh, Canada is on board. They, uh, they don't currently participate in the, current, the work I, I do at the moment, but they of course, they work with us uh, regarding the space station work. And in uh, my previous job, I did a lot of Canadian uh, cooperation regarding telecommunications work. As you can see, we actually have a list of countries. Some of the new EU member states will, are on their ascension path to join ESA. So typically, we cooperate them with a, a period, and eventually, they become full member states. You can see here, this is everything that ESA takes care of. Uh, it's quite a broad range of activities, and I think it pretty much encompasses everything you can think of regarding the exploitation uh, of space, space science, telecoms, human spaceflight uh, operations, uh, and more specifically technology development to lead to successful programs in the future. Okay, it's a bit quick summary of where we're based. So it's, there's no one single location for us. I'm based at uh, ESTEC in the Netherlands. I've got a little video that I'll be able to show a bit later. 
Uh, headquarters are in Paris. Uh, I work for STEC, the main technical hub of the space agency. Space operations and astronaut training is in Germany. Uh, space operations, uh, so, sorry, space science operations is in uh, just outside Madrid. We have an Earth Observation Center just outside Rome, and then scattered stations and offices around the world. You can see here Australia's contribution, the two ground stations in West Australia. Uh, and we have sort of small offices in Moscow and the US. Uh, they're primarily to work with our international partners, of course. So I think our US offices is Washington and Houston and Moscow for our Russian office to work with Roscosmos and our other Russian partners. So quick, okay, this is quite, uh, quite complicated, but it just represents the country's funding. So every country contributes money to the mandatory program, which is actually the program I work for, science, and they optionally uh, contribute to the other programs, telecoms, human space flights. This represents the breakdown between all the countries. You can see the biggest chunks are the, the big players in the European uh, aerospace field, typically France, Germany, Italy, the United Kingdom. So every country that uh, participates, they, uh, we have this concept of geographical return. So if a country puts in money uh, to the space agency, they will of course receive money back through the term, through uh, things like industrial contracts, cooperation, uh, information access to scientific data. So that's the, the underlying goal of the space agency is to promote uh, space science and space technology. So when they contribute into the agency, they receive uh, uh, a, a return back in the form of uh, space technology contracts and the like. Yeah, so I, I, I won't dwell too long on this. I know there, I have some much, much more interesting pictures later on. This is a breakdown in terms of from areas. So you can see the one that I look after is up here, the scientific program. So 506 million a year as a year. That's a normally enough to, to keep, we normally have quite a few missions under development, I'll go through those. And it keeps our uh, funding secure for the missions to come. So we actually we have planning right up until 20, 2030, 2035. So it's very long term planning for scientific mission development. If you're curious, the, the, there's about 2,000, just over 2,000 staff, and there's a significantly more uh, uh, higher number of contractors who work for work at all the ESA sites. And if you're curious, there's no Australia there obviously, but I'm actually a European uh, dual citizen, which of course is one of the reasons I'm working at the European Space Agency, it lets me work as a staff there. Unfortunately, non-Europeans non, um, non who are not participating in the uh, ESA, they are unfortunately not allowed to be staff members. This is one of the, one of the rules of the agency. Uh, any nationality can work as contractors, but only European uh, uh, citizens can work as staff members. A little quick summary of the, there's 11 directorates from telecom, science, the one I currently work in. These are the ones I've actually been exposed to myself, so. Uh, my first job was in the directorate called technically, Technical and Quality Management, and there, the experts across uh, a wide range of fields. So they, they're the ones who provide the technical expertise in everything from material science to semiconductors, solar panels. So when we build a mission uh, for, for science, for instance, we call upon all the experts from this directorate. So I, I, have, I used to work in a product assurance department and then uh, the electrical engineering department. And my later job was in telecoms. Now, uh, when I get to the telecommunications section, I'll explain a little bit about what I did in, in telecoms. So, East is an industrial policy. So, uh, essentially, East doesn't build anything themselves. Uh, we provide the project management and the mechanism by which missions are developed by Europe. So, 85% of our money goes back into European industry. Uh, it's a similar model to NASA, but I believe NASA's probably percentage going back into industry is less than 85%. ESA has more of our work done outside of industry. So ESA is more of the project manager mechanism uh, that governs how that money is spent. Uh, and most of my work, for instance, is, is spent on industrial procurement. So actually uh, organizing companies around Europe, uh, institutions, uh, universities to actually build the space missions and they're, they're managed by ESA and launched by ESA. 
and then operated typically by ESA in most circumstances. Okay, now a little bit about some a bit more interesting, some of the missions. So you should see some of these would hopefully ring a bell. Giotto, uh, a common flyby, not nearly as uh, high profile as our most recent mission, which I'll come to. Smart one is a fascinating one. It was a low cost, relatively low cost. I think it was about 100 million euros. Okay, low cost for ESA. Uh, it was a European mission to the moon. Uh, the other ones, are, these are way before my time, some of them, so I can't actually give you a huge amount of information. One of our biggest recent successes uh, prior to Rosetta was, of course, the Hugens probe that landed on the surface of Titan. Uh, it only operated for a very short period of time. It was, a, it was an instrument dropped off from the, the NASA, NASA Cassini probe. Uh, Cassini, I believe, is still operating. Uh, it has long since uh, uh, stopped working. It was only had very limited battery life, no solar panels. Uh, but it was a great success at the time. Uh, most distant landing ever. So on a, on a moon. Uh, we go some of the current missions operating. So, okay, the one that probably you know, everyone will recognize is Hubble. So Hubble is primarily a NASA mission, but 30% of it was contributed and built by the European Space Agency. Uh, I think uh, the original solar panels were from uh, ESA, and I think we have the old ones at work. That when they, during one of the servicing missions, uh, they actually, after they brought it back, the, the panels back down to study, we actually uh, we have them mounted, I think, in our, our museum attached to our, uh, our facility at work. Some future, uh, sorry, some other currently operating missions. So we have the two express missions, Mars and Venus. They are actually built on a, a similar platform, so they were called Express on the basis that we produce two missions very quickly. So uh, I think that's uh, Express, not necessarily meaning how fast they got to their targets. Venus Express, unfortunately, it looks like it's uh, it's not faring so well. It's went at the end of its operational life, but uh, I think we're going to. Uh, it's uh, uh, almost at the end of its life. Mars Express, I believe, will continue operating. Basically, we have we design the missions with a, a few years operational life, and if they last longer, it's fantastic. If we can find the funding to keep them operating, we keep them we keep them operating for as long as possible to bring in as much data from the scientific community as possible. Uh, Gaia has only recently launched. Uh, we haven't seen so much data uh, yet from from Gaia, but I believe it's operating. Uh, normally, there's a few hiccups, I think, at the start, but it's going quite well. Planck, Herschel Planck, was a, uh, another observatory type mission, which is also going very, uh, the data was, I think, quite useful. I have some, there we go, a bit of a snapshot. I uh, had the, this is the Herschel Planck spacecraft in the background with one of my colleagues, Jeffrey, who worked on the AIT campaign. Uh, I was lucky enough to do a tour uh, of the facility when the spacecraft was being tested just before launch. This is one of my favorites. It's a, it's a selfie taken by the Rosetta spacecraft as, as it approached the comet. Now, the comet's name is completely unpronounceable. Uh, I'm just going to refer to it as 67P. It's much easier. So you can see 67P in the background. And unfortunately, it doesn't come up so well. But you can actually see the outgassing from the comet. Um, ah. Just see the outgassing from the comet. Of course, we're all very excited. So the lander, the Philae lander, has uh, has gone into hibernation mode, but we have high hopes that in the future, uh, as the comet approaches the sun, the, the solar panels will receive enough power to to reawaken the lander. But it's a uh, the lander, uh, the the uh, the, um, the orbiter remains completely functional and in orbit around the comet, and we're hoping to get some some good science this year. Here's another, op, another closer uh, image of the comet. And so up, up close, you can, of course, you can see there are, fact, there are dune type structures, cliffs, boulders. So I thought we were all very excited when we saw this at work. Now, much of the, uh, the scientific data, the imaging data, we only a certain amount is a certain amount of it is released to the public. And in fact, even people like myself, uh, the, the public available data is basically the same information that I would be. I would have access to. 
the scientific community, uh, we uh, they get first dibs on the data, so to speak. So much of the data. So over the, over the coming years, you'll see more and more information released as the scientists uh, uh, have an opportunity to, to go through the, the detailed images. So in many cases, the images that you were able to download, there are much higher versions. So, question? Yeah, why do they do this? It's a very interesting question. It's uh, quite a controversial one too. It often often comes up at lunchtime around the uh, at work. Uh, they, they see it as the basis that the scientists have invested a lot of their time in, in designing the instruments that go on to a spacecraft like Rosetta. And they believe that uh, the scientific community, and ESA agrees with them, that they should have the first right of all the data. Uh, so it gives them an opportunity. They've often invested sometimes decades into this project, and they, they don't like the idea of someone else stealing their thunder when they have invested uh, maybe 10, 20 years of their time. So I can understand that there's arguments going both ways of why I think uh, NASA might have a, a more open approach to the data, but uh, European scientific community decided that uh, the critical scientific data is, uh, is held under wraps until it has, until the principal investigators of the instruments get the first look at all the data, and then it's released to the public. And does that normally take a few years, or? It's a good question. I actually don't know. So uh, I, I assume it's as fast as the researchers can go through the data. In many cases, there's a lot of data, so I guess it depends on the volume. Now, the great one of the field, I guess, very small, but you can just see this is a snapshot taken by the Rosetta Craft of the Philae lander departing the orbiter. So the Philae lander was a very ambitious uh, uh, side project, almost, because the Rosetta the main Rosetta orbiting craft was the, the primary science mission and the orbiter it was a higher risk uh, a side mission and we were very excited that it worked. Uh, it didn't work perfectly as many of you uh, might have read in the newspapers. Uh, it did bounce on the spacecraft, it bounced on the, the comet a few times. Not all the, the landing mechanisms worked, so the harpooning, the top thruster I believe didn't work, but it did land eventually, not in the best spot, it was overshadowed by a cliff. Uh, but in many respects, we're, we're lucky because the, space, the landing spacecraft would have never have survived, I think, the thermal differential uh, once the, the comet approaches the sun. And now, because it's shaded by a cliff, we might actually be able to get some data out of it at a much later stage in the mission that we, we never thought would, would be possible. So, I guess this is what happens. Uh, you, uh, you run with what happens. You run with uh, the good and the bad. Okay, now some upcoming missions. So this is um, this is more my area of expertise. Now I'm responsible for financial sort of management of the, the missions under study. So some of these missions are already being built: Lisa Pathfinder, Bepi Colombo, Kiops, and Solar Orbiter. So they're currently being built by industries around Europe. Uh, Bepi Colombo, for instance, uh, the spacecraft itself is currently at my work, undergoing testing for a, a launch uh, later. And the Kiops mission is actually under my responsibility. So I will see Kiops, uh, it's currently being built uh, in Spain, uh, and it will launch 2017. And I'm the project control of this mission. So this is actually my first full mission from, from initial development, uh, sorry, initial study phase, right through to development, and launch, and in-orbit commissioning. Uh, close up. So this is just an artist's rendition because we should space for us to all pieces uh, until it's integrated. Uh, it's just a single. So it stands for characterizing exoplanet. It's a small class mission. So ESO's scientific program uh, has three levels of mission, small, medium, and large. And if you, uh, in terms of the monetary cost, small is 50 million euros. Uh, medium is 500 million euros, and large is 1 billion euros. So Rosetta is approaching the 1 billion euro mark. Uh, and Kiosk is, is a fraction of the price. So the idea is that East is trying to do something a little bit unusual for a government uh, agency. We're going to try and do a fast, cheap mission, see how it works out. So um, I guess I, <laughs> I'm going to be held responsible for this one. Uh, uh, it's, it's, on, it's going well. Uh, we've, uh, we've been going. Uh, 
We have, uh, there's obviously some risks involved in doing a very fast development program. Traditionally, ESA takes about six years to develop a spacecraft. We're doing it in, uh, in, in half that time. Uh, we tried to use high technology readiness uh, components, so we're not developing any new technology for this mission, unlike uh, other missions. Uh, it'll be a, a light spacecraft, you can see. It's only 250 kilos, which is very small for an ESA mission small dimensions, a single instrument, which is just a CCD, and its science uh, is going to be very targeted. Uh, we're not going to be looking for existing exoplanets. We're going to look at the existing uh, stars that would have known to host exoplanets and characterize those exoplanets. So just pulling more information, uh, I think it's the planetary transit method across the face of the host star. So and I'm, the science is, is I must be much beyond me, but this, my uh, project science will be able to explore in detail, you can infer obviously a massive amount of information if you stare at, at the planet you transit long enough. You can infer, I think, atmospheric conditions and this type of thing. But I won't, uh, <laughs> please don't ask me any questions about the, the science of uh, uh, planetary transits. Now, these are a few uh, upcoming missions. Um, James Webb Space Telescope, so that's another combined NASA mission. So primarily the spacecraft is NASA, the main spacecraft bus. And we're going to contribute, I think, it's a range of instruments. Uh, Euclid, I don't know so much about. JUICE, I can tell you a lot about. So JUICE is Europe's uh, Jupiter mission. And I have spent uh, the last year working on, on JUICE. It was in its preliminary study phase. Uh, it's, a, it's a large class mission, so a 1 billion euro mission. Uh, it's got some unusual problems of its own. Uh, Europe for various political reasons, uh, we don't use nu nuclear powered spacecraft, and by that I mean radioisotope thermal generators. Not so even RTGs? No, Europe, Europe is uh, it's a very politically sensitive issue. So all our spacecraft are battery and solar panels. Wow. So it doesn't mean it's not going to be precluded in future, but uh, there are many reasons behind it. Of course, the, do you have an additional question? No, I was going to say, does that mean you don't do nuclear clocks either? Uh, that's an interesting question. We have some future missions that potentially would have uh, clocks, uh, but it's primarily the uh, the ITG component. Uh, now, the, there are safety issues associated with an ITG. If your launch goes wrong and you have a spacecraft with an ITG, you end up with a big mess if you have an accident. So, the politics of Europe pretty much determines that we uh, we take the conservative approach. So we, uh, we have uh, solar panels and batteries for juice. But because it's of course going to the Jupiter system, solar intensity is very low. We have uh, traditional solar cells that we might use on other missions closer to the sun. Uh, the solar cells are not suitable enough. I think what we need to have what's designed is low intensity, low temperature solar cells. So I was involved in the, the procurement uh, and development uh, a new generation of solar cells specifically for the JUICE mission. Um, the Jupiter environment is also very nasty uh, in terms of radiation effects, so uh, more so than say something you've had in Earth orbit, or even some of the Lagrangian point missions like L2, we have an observational mission. The, uh, many of the components have to be uh, are developed, under development are being specially radiation hardened. Uh, certain instruments, scientific instruments, they have to be developed just with the JUICE mission in mind. Uh, so this is why you can see our launch targeted dates 2022. It will probably go on top of an Ariane 5, maybe even an Ariane 6, the new generation of launcher. It's our biggest launch vehicle. It'll be a very big spacecraft, very heavy, many, many instruments. Uh, huge solar array, obviously, to power it that far out. Question? Sorry, no, I keep no, interrupting. I, I think we have a small enough group here. I'm happy to take questions. Sorry, Sorry guys. Yeah. Um, You'll say there's a lot of radiation in Jupiter. Presumably it's far from the sun. Where is the radiation coming from? I believe the Jupiter system itself. Okay. It generates uh, quite a nasty... Uh, electron. Electron light. Yes. Which of course probably because of probably electro electronics, solar panels, everything has to be particularly designed. So, JUICE is a, is a fantastic mission and I've actually just... It's just finished study phase, so it's still a paper mission, but it's been formally adopted by our program board, so the sign the scientists who govern our mission construction, uh, the approvals, they've formally adopted it, so we're, we're now full steam into development. Uh, 
the next phase, which is called B2, which doesn't really mean much, but essentially we go from phase A, which is a paper study phase, right through to phase E, where the spacecraft's in operation. So these are sort of ESA definitions. So it's now passed its sort of study, preliminary study phase. Uh, it's been declared it's ready. So we basically essentially, we have it, not all the technologies are ready, but it means that they have been identified. Uh, there's a development path uh, assigned. So we know that we're comfortable that we can get into a 2022 launch uh, based upon what we, we know right now. So essentially, like I said, there's a very long path for ESA missions, particularly when you're doing something as unusual as going to the Jupiter system. All those technology development do take quite some time. So this is a little bit of a background about the, the cosmic vision. Uh, it's not really a program, but it's an encapsulation of what's the long-term planning for our ESA missions. So you can see there are some questions there. Uh, how did we get from the Big Bang to where we are? Where did, we, where did life come from? Are we alone? These type of questions. Now ESA always studies a range of missions. So before we select and adopt a mission, we normally have we down select from maybe a hundred missions, and we do a, a, a down selection every time. So we get a, we actually ask for a call for missions, and I think anyone in Europe can actually propose a mission. Typically, they come from universities and scientists. So I think some are immediately discounted as either completely unfeasible, but of course they're down selected uh, for the last round of medium class missions. So this is 500 million euro mission. We, we came down to five candidate missions. Not all of them survived, unfortunately. Uh, one of the really exciting ones, which didn't go ahead, but we might resurrect in future, was a, an asteroid sample return called Marco Polo, uh, or Marco Polo R. The, the mission was a near-Earth asteroid rendezvous, a counter uh, a sample, and then we're going to drop, I think, a capsule back in, in the, uh, the Woomera area. But uh, unfortunately, our scientific community decided that uh, a planetary transit uh, uh, telescope, an exoplanet finder, was of more interest. So that's our next medium class mission. So I'm currently working on the financial planning for that. Uh, we also have, for the future, we'll have an X-ray telescope. That'll be a large class mission. And much, much further in the future, we're probably going to look at gravitational wave. So gravitational wave observatory. Now one of the missions uh, that's currently under, under under development, it's called Lisa Pathfinder. That's testing the technology that will eventually fly in a full gravitational wave. So any physicists in the room, I'm sure can explain it much better than me. The gravitational wave, I think you have twin spacecraft with lasers in between, uh, very sensitive instruments to, to try and determine if you can detect gravitational waves. The physicists think it's a fantastic idea, right? but from what I understand, trying to do that on Earth is very difficult, but in space you have a much better chance. So anyway, so this, these are all things under development at the moment. Now, there's also a Mars exploration program. This is actually an optional program. So all the programs, all the missions I work on are compulsory. So all the member states must contribute money. The Mars program is optional. So many countries decide not to participate in Mars exploration. Now, it's going to be a cooperative mission with Russia. It'll be uh, two spacecraft and eventually a, a landing craft to do service operations on Mars. It proposes its own problems, of course it needs its own technology. So we have our own technology development program, which is again also optional. It can be quite difficult when key technology you know are developed in certain countries, but those countries choose not to participate in the program. So uh, often our work is actually speaking to European politicians, uh, European scientific communities, to try and build up enough momentum for things like optional missions to go ahead. Would you say the political environment is getting better over time in Europe for space-related stuff, or is it getting more restrictive? No, it seems to be, in my experience, in the last eight years, I would say it's getting better. We're cooperating more and more, we get more and more countries involved, which is, of course, also quite difficult. You get new member states who are not familiar with ESA. They are trying to build up their own capabilities. Uh, a lot of my work is... Um, is getting technologies, technologies for new missions uh, to be developed in the new, the newer member states. States that traditionally don't have a lot of space background, but they often have very unusual technologies that are ter terrestrial based that we now look at the space applications. So for instance, there's a, as, an, as an example, for instance, uh, Norway spends a lot of money on mild, uh, mining and gas. They're, they have very, a lot of experience in the offshore gas industry. 
And I think it's surprising when you look at some of those technologies, the uh, of course drilling and this type of thing, you can see the immediate application of things like when you land on other planetary bodies. So this is a, but many of these are very early technologies. So we, we often refer to this technology readiness level. So we're building up capability, TRL, the, the lowest technology readiness level is basically a paper study to the point where you end up at the other end of the scale where you have a manufacturable technology. So something that you can just churn off the manufacturing line, put straight on the spacecraft that it's tested, uh, it's qualified for space use, this type of thing. So more, our, most of our goals for, for technology development is to go from a paper, a paper study right to something, a proven technology. Uh, a little bit about our operations center. For, so this is outside of Madrid. Hosts uh, many scientists who are responsible for collating uh, the scientific data from the spacecraft. The main operations center is in Germany, but that's spacecraft operations. So this is taking basically all the information from the scientific uh, aspect of the mission. So all the instruments go through our office in Madrid. Now, these are the missions I don't know so much about, but I've got a bit of a summary. Earth observation, if you remember from the earlier graph, is a, is a bit bigger than the number of, uh, in terms of scientific, the scientific budget. Uh, it's probably uh, an aspect of the European Space Agency that is more, it's closer to uh, people on Earth than, say, a, a, a planetary mission. So many of our missions, uh, they're very large missions, they're typically in Earth orbit for obvious reasons. Uh, NBSAT was a fantastic success. It was a massive spacecraft, which has unfortunately now stopped responding, but it well passed its design life, so we're all very happy that it lasted so long. Uh, it now poses its own problems because it's a very large spacecraft in orbit, in a busy orbit, uh, which of course we're hoping in future we will have a mission uh, to either recover it, deorbit it, uh, or maybe retask it. So, uh, our older missions uh, typically didn't have, uh, the very older missions didn't have a, an end of life plan. And now uh, the agency is very strict. We have internal guidelines when you, when you launch a mission, you have to have a, an end of life plan. So typically, you, you, if it's in Earth orbit, you boost it up into a graveyard orbit, or you deorbit it uh, to keep the, uh, the busier uh, orbits clean. And I think yeah, everyone, I think, might have in this room probably read about that uh, we've had. Uh, Chinese, uh, there was a, they, they tested an anti-spacecraft uh, and it created a whole bunch of debris uh, and of course there's a, a large number of old uh, boosters in orbit and collisions of course are becoming more and more likely. The space station has to be moved to avoid things. So ESA very much has, uh, it's going towards the line that we have to start. This is going to become a real issue. So uh, we have uh, dedicated groups, some of my colleagues in fact involved in uh, clean space, space initiatives, what do you do with large pieces of uh, debris, and some uh, ideas of you know, grappling uh, old spacecraft and deorbiting, refueling them, and retasking them, this type of thing. Uh, ESRIN is the office outside of uh, Italy that focuses on all the data from uh, the, the, the um, Earth observation. Lovely office, I luckily, uh, when I started at ESA, they took me there for a few days to just experience some of the the other ESA sites. Uh, I have a large number of ground station antennas there and a lot of data processing. I think all our IT, most of our IT hardware is based in, in Italy at this facility. Uh, these just to some of the missions. Uh, GoTo is a really uh, interesting one, mapping the gravitational field. Actually, if you have a chance, if you look it up online, I forgot to take a picture of the spacecraft. The spacecraft probably looked the coolest, I think, uh, of any, any ESA spacecraft. It was a very, very low orbit, so it actually had to be designed with some atmospheric drag in mind. I think it was only 100, 200, 200 kilometer orbit. It was a very short mission, had ion thrusters, and actually looked like a rocket. You have to have a chance. Uh, Swarm is. Uh, it was a, a mission, uh, one of my friends was actually the project controller's mission, so it launched, uh, I don't know so much about the mission itself, but it actually launched from a Russian launch vehicle in northern Russia, which I think uh, all my colleagues tell me is quite an experience. Uh, it's a military base, uh, they launch on, on top of converted ballistic missiles, and if, it, if you're there for a winter launch, I think, you, uh, I think they get very jealous of people that get a nice South American launch from French Guiana in the middle of the summer, so, or a Cape Kennedy launch. 
think uh, if I had the opportunity, of course, I would uh, move into the sea. Uh, uh, but I think uh, my, the, the mission for which I'm responsible it would either be uh, a US-based launch or a European launch out of French Guiana. French Guiana is at the top of the list. I think. So but when we design a mission, we typically have a few launch vehicles in mind. Uh, typically speaking, the launch operators, so the European launch vehicles uh, have a commercial arm. If they're full up with a commercial uh, commercial plan for satellite operators, we often have to find alternate plans. So of course, it's, uh, ESA gets the discounted rate for the launches. Uh, commercial operators, uh, commercial operators get, sometimes get precedence. Things don't, don't always go to plan with launch vehicles. So you typically always have a, a secondary plan in, in, in mind for a spacecraft launch. The meteorological missions. So a lot of these are designed in cooperation with UMENSAT, uh, which is another European uh, organization similar to ESA. So a lot of these are built and managed by ESA for UMENSAT. And these are the most recent uh, constellation, the Copernicus mission. So it's a series of spacecraft called the Sentinels, which I, this is I believe the first Sentinel on the, on the diagram here. It'd be a series of spacecraft and or payloads to monitor Earth for okay, climate change, uh, security. Typically speaking, because ESA is a civilian agency, we never uh, we say security purposes, not military purposes. So I think in this day and age, of course, uh, security is at the top of everyone's mind. Now, telecoms and integrated applications is an interesting area of the edge. This is an area where I spent about two, three years. Uh, they're very much uh, embedded with European industry. They're much closer to it than, say, the scientific area where I currently work, where there's no long-term, immediate financial interest for companies, for instance, of course, if you're launching to Jupiter. Uh, the technologies built, built there are typically only maybe viable for planetary missions. But for telecoms, of course, this is where we have stuff like TV, uh, any other uh, applications for telecommunications with uh, Earth orbit. So this is a bit of a summary of our, of our I think uh, very early on, ESA was involved in telecoms missions. Artemis is an interesting one. It was a satellite that went into the wrong orbit, but they did recover. It did use its orbital thrusters to recover, and I think it's still working. So it's uh, been a fantastic success. It probably only had an operational life for three years, so 2014, we're not doing too badly. I think uh, the idea is that eventually uh, we can we can use this and retask this satellite. It was also a, uh, a forerunner for laser communication terminals for a European technology. So I actually worked on this particular research program. So what we did was we used to co-fund activities. A company used to come to me and say, I'd like to develop a technology that we can eventually sell in the European market. And I would provide 50% of the funding and they would go away. They'd have to show a business plan and we would evaluate them. And I think I was, Per year, I was we were signing up to 80 contracts with the European industry. It was worth maybe 50 to 100 million euros. It was, uh, it was a very impressive program and very much appreciated by European industry. Uh, this is the newest ESA centre, just based south of Oxford, and it's going to be the primarily primarily the new uh, location for telecoms. Uh, science, I think we only have a few staff members there, but eventually the idea is that uh, traditionally the UK didn't contribute. Uh, to the same level as, uh, say, that some of the bigger nations like France and Germany. We normally ask for a contribution for each country based upon GNP, and Europe, uh, sorry, the UK did not uh, contribute up to that level, but they're actually been, over the last few years, they've been increasing the contribution, and because they've been doing that, we now have a UK centre. You might have seen from the map that uh, uh, we have sites all around Europe, so most of the major European powers are covered, but the UK will be the newest one. This site is uh, it's currently under construction now. We have offices there, but it's temporary, and then eventually we'll have a, a research center. Interestingly enough, it's based to place where they used to, I think they used to have a Britain's nuclear weapons program. It's long since been <laughs> retired, but uh, they now use it as a science park. So there's many interesting um, uh, companies, startups. I think they have something called the Diamond Light Source uh, Accelerators. Uh, <laughs> Hey look, we found a basement. I wonder what's in here. They actually, I believe, they had to decontaminate quite a lot of the site to make it uh, uh, so that it was usable. 
it was quite some time ago, but uh, they sure us it's all fine. <laughs> uh, the communications program is, um, many of the programs are implemented uh, with part in partnership with either industry or governments. So here we have some, they're Hylus, Alphabus, Small Geos, they're all going to be, they're all developed with ESA as a, as a partner with uh, European industry to, so Alphabus is like the large scale satellite platform and Small Geo is the opposite, it's a, it's a small platform in geostationary orbit, um, okay, different target markets, Alphabus is where you're just saturating yourself with your large uh, high density area, Small Geo you can target for, the idea is that eventually they can sell the Small Geo platform to other operators who are interested in covering an, uh, an, an area that doesn't have existing satellite coverage. And these are from future projects. Uh, EDRS data relay, so it's, uh, the idea is of course low earth orbit satellites, they pass over very quickly to get your data. You obviously only have a few opportunities, well, depending on what the orbit is, you, only, you have limited opportunities per day uh, to recover data from low earth orbit satellites. The idea is they transmit up to a satellite like EDRS, which will typically be a constellation. Uh, they have the low earth orbit satellites in much greater uh, they have much greater opportunities in terms of time to talk to them. Uh, and the idea is that then the EDRS constellation then transmits back to the ground stations. So I think it can be used for planetary missions as well. Uh, it's still under development. It's an interesting concept. I think, of course, uh, in European industry, our uh, international partners are all interested in uh, technologies like this uh, platforms that can uh, take the most advantage of uh, lower orbit. These are other upcoming missions. I uh, don't know so much about them, which it was after my time and I, these have all been implemented. In. Navigation. So, uh, GPS, of course, is the American system, and Europe decided that they wanted to be independent of the American system, so they have the Galileo uh, constellation. Uh, we have a few uh, satellites in orbit already. Uh, if you follow the space press, you might have realized that a few of our satellites were injected in the wrong orbit by its Russian launch vehicle. They have recovered them. Uh, I, I suspect at uh, some cost of fuel to put them into the right orbit. Eventually, will the full operational capability uh, will be 30 satellites. Uh, okay, we'll see how that one goes. It's uh, quite an ambitious mission uh, to have so many operational satellites uh, in such a short time frame. Uh, I can understand, you know, European Dependence across the GPS system, of course, is run by the, European, uh, the US Department of Defense, and of course, there's always the threat that potentially might be to involve, but I'm really not an expert in this matter. But I think this is, uh, of course, Europe decided to go down the independent path and have uh, Galileo, which is partly funded by the e EU and, uh, and ESA, and establish a system that is civilian and not military. This is probably some of the, uh, the more <coughs> more uh, publicly visible aspects of ESA is the, uh, the human spaceflight as aspects. So Europe contributes, uh, has contributed several modules and spacecraft to the space station. We have here Kapala, which is the very nice, uh, as you can see this is one of all the windows, I think it's an Italian built. Uh, the Columbus, the laboratory module, and, and we're probably quite well known for the ATV, so it was demonstrating automated docking technology. So it's a pressurized spacecraft, but not uh, not rated for carrying people, but it did have a pressurized cargo bay. Uh, five were built, uh, and we the technology, uh, we're not building anymore, because this ends our agreement with uh, our international partners on the space station, but the module, the propulsion module, will form a cooperation agreement with NASA to, to, to fight so in, and multi-purpose crew vehicle. The, so it'll be a European service module with the, the human rated factor contributed by NASA. This has only recently been agreed on. Uh, it doesn't exist yet, but it's a, it looks like it's going ahead. So ESA has its own astronaut core. Uh, these are some of the, these are the, the most recent. Six. So they were selected in Only within the last few years, so there, there's been quite a lot of European astronauts. This is the most recent group to go through, and when you actually start as a staff member of the agency, they normally have the, the newest astronauts group come through and have a little chat. So it's really nice you get to sit with them, get to have a chat with them, uh, 
Um, many of them are come from either military backgrounds. Uh, Thomas is the uh, the young French gentleman here. He's actually, I think, a, he's still a qualified Air France pilot. So, uh, as part of his ESA, uh, ESA training for his astronaut training, I think when he has spare time, he actually still manages to fly some commercial Air France flights to keep up his commercial uh, registration. Quite an interesting agreement, but uh, I think the English gentleman, Tim Peake here, so he's an ex. Uh, test pilot for the, uh, the U, uh, UK military. A few of my friends did apply. They got down. They got down to the last like few hundred, but it's pretty intensive testing. There's psychological testing, and they're really specific. Of course, you have to have vision guidelines within a very small uh, range. So even though you might have perfect eyesight, if the smallest little thing that discounts you, so you're taking out of the range. It's a very they had quite a few thousand applicants. Uh, very competitive. A little bit about the European launches now. I think I mentioned that the European Launch Development Organization was uh, originally based out of Woomera doing their testing. After that, they, the French government was mainly the driving force behind the Ariane launch vehicle. So this formed the current range of ESA launch vehicles. So we have uh, Vega, which is, uh, which is the small launch vehicle. Soyuz, which is actually the Russian launch vehicle, if you'll recognize it. But what Europe has decided to do, so we purchased the Soyuz, and we now operate it out of our own launch facility in French Guiana. Uh, so launch infrastructure had to be built. And because, uh, essentially, you may ask, well, why has Russia decided to sell its own launch vehicle to Europe? essentially because we have a very good launch site that Russia doesn't have such a good launch site in terms of equatorial uh, location. And it works well for both of us, of course, they get to operate uh, their launch people out of an equatorial launch site. We get a medium range uh, launcher for a payload, and we continue to run our Ariane 5, the, the, the launch, the large launch vehicle of the European family. The launch facility so it's an interesting arrangement. So ESA owns the launch structure, the launch facilities, uh, but they're operated by the French space, it's French space agency, Kinex. So this is a very complicated agreement. So we own the land and the facilities, but they operate it on our behalf. And then, of course, I mentioned the rocket companies themselves. The rockets themselves are operated by a commercial company called Ariane Spass, who manage the commercial sale of the, the launch vehicles. In terms of what's up for the future, this is an interesting project, the IXV, so it looks like a small space plane, it's unmanned, and uh, it's dem demonstrating a re-entry technique. So typically, ESA has not launched on the human spaceflight uh, domain in terms of having crewed vehicles. We launch our astronauts with the Russians or the Americans. This is something for the future, uh, just to test technology, so we'll see where, where it goes. Uh, Europe's been quite conservative with their human spaceflight. We have an astronaut core, obviously, but like I said, we don't launch them from our own uh, vehicles. All our vehicles are only man, uh, rated for cargo. And this, oops, skip one. So this is the, the next generation launch vehicle, Ariane 6, which is just agreed upon at the last meeting of all the science ministers, science and uh, industry ministers. So every few years, the ministers from Europe that represent ESA, they get together and they agree on the funding for the following next few years. So this is a very hot topic, the development of Ariane 6. There was a, two schools of thought. Do we continue developing the Ariane 5 or do we launch upon a, a new generation of uh, launch vehicle? And so this is an artist's concept for the Ariane 6. And it looks like this is the, what's going to be going ahead. So we will focus on the Ariane 6. A little bit about mission operations. So this is our office based out of Darmstadt. It's the main conduit for all the spacecraft operations. So you'll see, if you remember back, there was uh, a graph showing all our ground stations around the world. They all feed back to Darmstadt in Germany. Uh, if anyone watched the Rosetta landing, I think you almost entirely, that was all filmed at Darmstadt and the, the associated operation centers around Europe. Uh, ESOC is the, the central point, and you often have, say for instance, the, the lander, it had its operation center in uh, a DLR, one of the DLR sites, sometimes they're co-located with ESA facilities. 
Uh, so ESOC has operated, for instance, all our scientific spacecraft in the past. So they often have, they're uh, hard working guys, I must say, they're very, very sharp. Uh, they often have to, of course, work shifts to deal with uh, uh, spacecraft operations. It's uh, not a job I don't think I, not a job I could do, but to my hat goes off to them. Yeah, a little bit of background about now, so that's sort of primarily covers what ESA takes care of. Uh, and I thought maybe on a personal note, I'll go into a little bit of information about how I ended up at ESA. So I, I probably watched far too much science fiction as a child. Uh, I was the one up, you know, very late watching Star Trek and the like. Uh, I ended up a, in a quite a traditional choice at university, so I did the Bachelor of Commerce. Uh, I had a job at an accounting firm. Uh, I always had aspirations that I, sh I could do more, and particularly in the space industry. Uh, it, it, was quite, it was quite a tough decision. Eventually I decided uh, I had I vo volunteered for organisations like BlueSat, uh, the NSSA, National Space Society of Australia, ASRI, Australian, Australian Space Research Institute, I spent time on the so I, I really wanted to, to end up in a field uh, where I could apply my, my passion for space and scientific aspects. And I had, because I had my parents who are of a European background, uh, Europe seemed like a logical choice, so I actually quit my job, which is, um, I had a very comfortable job. Uh, and I, I just moved uh, to Europe with uh, a little bit of savings and some grand plans. Uh, it was pretty tough. I it was six months, if you see from uh, my timeline, between when I quit my job and I applied for every space job I could think of, initially in the UK to start with because that's where I had some family living and I actually wasn't successful all for six months. I got no interviews, nothing. So I was pretty, uh, feeling pretty low and I then, I didn't really, uh, I only spoke, I had a little bit of French knowledge, I didn't really consider working in Europe at the time, um, on the continent in say France, Germany, Italy, I didn't really think about, I uh, just assumed that I wouldn't be able to unless I learned another language, but I applied for jobs uh, and the first one that came up was where I currently work, and it was a maternity leave replacement, and then I read a little bit about ESA, their operating language is English, English and French, and you're required to have uh, a working knowledge of, uh, sorry, a, a fluent in one with a working knowledge of the other, I thought, well, my French is not so good, but it turns out, working in, in the Netherlands, we work almost the entire time in English. If you, if I, once sometimes I go to France to the head office, I have to. There's a little bit of information I have to attend in France, and sorry, it's done in French. It's it's quite manageable, and uh, officially speaking, uh, uh, English works, and it's fantastic. They offered me actually the job on the spot. I took a nine-month contract, and that was eight years ago. So I did work my way up. I started out uh, doing fairly junior job, I was processing invoices for uh, contracts with the industry. It was very, uh, okay, I, I met some fantastic people and they really helped me through. But in uh, 2010, I was offered a permanent staff role, which of course uh, means you have a lot more responsibility, but you also exposed a lot more uh, interesting aspects of the, the business. And my most recent posting was just over a year ago to my current job in the, the future missions area, which has been uh, really interesting. Uh, my next slide is a little bit about uh, what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. So I'm embedded with a team of engineers and scientists. So there's me, there's one other financial uh, person, my assistant controller, and we look at governing where our future missions are going to go. What technology do, do we need? Uh, what are the current missions under study? Uh, how are we going to pay for them? So for instance, I do a lot of budgeting work. I didn't spend a lot of time uh, doing what's called industrial procurement. So if anyone's worked at a government agency before procuring or a government agency is very complicated. We have very specific rules. It can be a little bit frustrating sometimes uh, yeah, because of those rules. Uh, but become, I've become quite good at it over eight years. So I have to spend a lot of time preparing reports to our, our, uh, our member states. So I write a lot of papers, I have to present to sometimes to councils, to 
get approval for to move forward on various missions. And a lot of the time, maybe twice twice a week, I have to evaluate proposals for coming from industry. So luckily, I don't look at the technical aspect. I'm interested. I read them, but I have a team of very very good technical people that look at the engineering aspects. Uh, I look at the financial aspect to see if that makes sense. So this is something I spend a lot of time on. And of course, I can't uh, forget whenever you have a spacecraft in, I of course get to pop into the spacecraft uh, test center. Most of the time I'm based at in the Netherlands. I travel a little bit. Most of the time it's to our headquarters in Paris to either do an official presentation or uh, training sessions. Next, uh, sorry, this year, 2015, I will probably be visiting uh, the, the spacecraft manufacturer who's building a uh, Kiev's mission. This is a little bit of background about uh, careers at ESA. As I mentioned, unfortunately, only European citizen members uh, that contribute to the space agency become, can become staff. And we have always published our, our uh, vacancies. Uh, now, the, my first point of entry was as a contractor. And anyone with a work visa for the Schengen, for instance, the Schengen Treaty countries, which is the Netherlands, France, Germany, can, can apply for jobs. And often, I've had a few Australian friends, uh, some who study at USW or Sydney University. They actually applied from Sydney and they are able to obtain contracting positions uh, where I work. It's a little bit more challenging. There is a, there's a longer lead time, a bit more uh, effort has to be go, go into, go into uh, preparing say, visa applications. They have to show basically that you're an expert in your field and there's no European person that can fill that need right now. Sorry. Normally that means they open up an advert. They don't get any European applications. They can, can take uh, a non-European and apply for visas. It's a pretty, uh, it's like I said, it's more complicated than if you're a European citizen, but it's not unusual. So where we're uh, at STEC in the Netherlands, we found there's about 10, 10, 12 Australians now working at STEC, which is really encouraging. We keep finding them. We thought we'd spotted them all, but uh, we now have an Australian lunch once a week. So it's, uh, sorry, not once a week, but once a month. Many of them do have dual nationalities or have become European citizens simply because they've lived in the Netherlands or France or Germany long enough. Uh, this is the website I actually used, so I'm not connected with them at all. But they were very useful in finding jobs in the space industry. That's where my initial contracting position. So all I needed was, of course, the, the, the door in. ESA has a, quite a large barrier to entry in terms of uh, getting your foot in the door. And once you're there and you've made a good impression, uh, it, was, it was much easier. So you know, I had very little connection with the European industry initially. So so this is a aerial view of where I work. It's a bit like a university campus. Uh, I think someone told me once it's the size of the Vatican City, which is not that big. There's a large amount of green space, and you'll actually recognize that in fact it's not just a park, it's actually a golf course. So we do have a golf course on site. There was a reason uh, the, the local government council, they told us that we had to have a certain amount of green space, so we have a golf course. It was better than a park. <laughs> Is that an artist's impression of it, or is that what it actually looks like? No, that's what it actually looks like. It's very clean. Yes. So, uh, the buildings are quite old. Many of them are from the 60s and 70s. So it does feel very much like a university campus. Uh, it has all, all facilities on site. So there's a bank, there's a travel agency, there's multiple restaurants, there's a bar, a sports complex. Um, <laughs> it's about golf, uh, yeah, golf course, <laughs> swimming pool, <laughs> tennis courts. <laughs> And you can see the Dutch coast, the North Sea coast, just up here. The uh, beach is quite nice, but unfortunately the water is nothing like Australia. It's uh, crystal clear blue. So, sorry, uh, I realise there's. I'm running out of time. And I did have a video. Maybe I'll show that at the end to anyone that can stay. It was just a summary of the site. I have a few quick snapshots to finish my uh, presentation. I got invited to uh, NASA launch, STS-134. I missed the launch because it was scrubbed while I was on the pad. It was fueled. The astronauts were on board, uh, including the European, uh, one of the European astronauts. I didn't get to see that launch, but I saw an Atlas launch, and the shuttle went up about two weeks later. But I had a nice holiday in Florida. Uh, the, the night before the planned launch, I got to meet uh, the NASA administrator, uh, Charlie, who was an interesting guy. My boss was there, Jean-Jacques Dordain, the, uh, the Director General of the European Space Agency. 
the end, the, the astronauts were not allowed to come to that because they were in quarantine, but their families were all there, so it was quite nice. This is the council room. This is where I have to present occasionally. A bit daunting when you have all the countries, um, typically ministers or representatives of the ministries. Uh, so I've, I've had to present, I think, twice. Interesting because the French and the German delegations, they only speak in their native, their native languages, even though they can speak English. <laughs> uh, because they're pressured by it. So you have to wear a headset, and they ask their questions, and you get a real-time translated. I don't know how these real-time translators do it, but obviously they're very good at what they do. And then I answer back, and they real-time translate it back into either French, <laughs> French and German. Very, uh, very difficult. This is a mock-up of a planetary uh, surface. So you can see some test landers <laughs> and a trailer. You know, obviously, though, I think they're loading in more sand. Uh, it's one of the, some of the more interesting facilities in my work. Now, this is an astronaut training center in Cologne. I was quite happy to see they had a red, big red button. Sorry. I think this is for ATV, so the docking of the ATV. So they had, if for some reason something went wrong, they had a, the astronauts had an abort button. And uh, this is astronaut training again. Uh, they mock up, of course, the spacecraft so the astronauts can train them. So they train in Cologne, the European astronauts, Cologne, Houston, Star City, and Moscow. So that's just a few quick snaps. These, most of these were taken on my phone during my various travels. So I know I've probably gone a little bit over time. Yes, I've got this. That's actually my recipe. So my parents gave me a So I. If, uh, I know I've uh, gone over time, but maybe if there is people who want to stay back. I do have a few videos if people are interested, uh, otherwise I'll... Okay, the time issue is really just for those of us that have a meeting at 2, which is me plus some others. Um, <laughs> so the way we're going to do questions is we're going to congratulate and thank Peter now. Thank you very much. <laughs> Unfortunately, the question is going to have to happen in my absence. Um, but because it's out of turn time, you've probably got as much time as you like to answer questions. Yeah, I'm not actually, I can show some videos, I can yeah. show the videos that the people that have to leave, then I'll uh, yeah. um, So, um, thanks everybody, and I'm afraid I'm not going to have to leave, so. <laughs> okay, I might just switch back to the videos. <laughs> <laughs> So this one's uh, just, I think it's only two minutes. It's about the, about aesthetic. There's no, I think there's only text on screen and some music. A little bit of a summary about what happens. So this is an interesting, uh, this is the concurrent design facility. So when they're doing a mission, when they're studying a mission, they get all the engineers, all the technical expertise in their fields, uh, uh, rocket propulsion, uh, structural, thermal, uh, solar power, batteries, they all sit around this table. And they, they, don't, do, uh, they don't do linear design, so they all put their inputs in at the same time. You have like a team leader who compiles everything up the front. The idea being that you end up with a spacecraft, a preliminary spacecraft design, uh, much faster uh, than a traditional, say, handing things along the line. Oops.
they have the flag for every member state out the front. They have to keep putting in more flag poles because member states are joining us. Do the countries each have their own requirements about whose flags are in what order, like Australia does, and getting annoyed at each other? No, I think they're just in the order upon which they join. So mm -hmm. the, um, yeah, it's very, it's very straightforward. So this is the design facility I mentioned. So I've actually sat in on a one for an upcoming science mission, which is really interesting. You see, uh, they come up with the rough order of magnitude costs for the spacecraft, and I put it all together with all the other costs associated with procuring a mission, the operations costs, the science operations costs, the cost of the actual staff, and I have to see whether it fits in my envelope so the centrifuge unfortunately is not ready for people. It carries it can carry a person, but I think it would probably kill them. Are you using Kerbals for all this work? <laughs> Many of my colleagues do run the Kerbal Space Program. Uh, it's very, it's very good experience. So. There's a great um, graph on the web of um, years of spent uh, tertiary education trying to learn about space and a sudden jump when people start playing Kerbal Space yeah. Program. So this is the Erasmus Center where they have some mock-ups of the space station. Uh, that planetary surface that I showed in one of my pictures is just behind here. Uh, they have a, a mock-up of the Columbus module. This is the business incubator, so spinning up the technologies for terrestrial use. So they have like a open plan area where people with ideas can uh, can have some office, office space. And then there's a museum attached to where I work that uh, accepts members of the public and you can go in and do a tour of the test centre. We often have uh, receptions there, like for instance the Rosetta landing we had uh, at the museum. So that was a very quick summary of the uh, uh, facility. So it's probably the most interesting facility that ESA has. The headquarters is mostly offices, which are also interesting. Interesting from a program perspective, a political perspective. But uh, operations is great when you have something going on, uh, like the Rosetta mission. Uh, but ESA, uh, where I work, has the, the test facilities. Uh, you often see the spacecraft come through. So I saw some of the large scientific missions, some of the ATVs transfer vehicles. Uh, you often see the astronauts at lunchtime in the cafeteria, which is quite, it seems quite funny, but of course they're just normal people. <laughs> Many of the retired astronauts uh, often take up management jobs uh, at Estec, so some of uh, Christopher Fuglesen, the Swedish astronaut, he's, uh, he's there managing some of their scientific uh, experiments in the space station. Any questions? Regarding the test facilities, uh, for instance, test chambers, are they available for hire to third parties? I believe so, yes. They're actually operated, so they're owned by ESOP, but they're operated by a commercial venture called European Test Services, and I believe anyone can contact them. I assume the preference gets given to ESA missions, but uh, there's a range of, there's like the large space simulator where you can put an entire large space record, but of course there's many, uh, there's anechoic chambers, radiation test facilities. Uh, I believe most of them are accessible. Might not be, it might be quite hard to find, but European test services, ETS, are the ones who run the large test facilities. Just wondering, uh, the cost of the, the Chaos mission, yeah. did you say that's under 50 million dollars? It's 50 million euros. Oh, 50 million euros, sure. Yeah. Um, is that including, uh, like, are there any externalities involved, like the launcher, perhaps? Yep, yeah, that's including the launcher. That's including the launcher. It's only a small space prop, so sure. the cost will go as a secondary payload on It'll probably go on a Vega as a secondary payload. Yeah, but like I said, uh, uh, the launches are they're, they're ESA developed launches, but operate they're uh, operated by the launch facilities, operated by Kinez, and the launch the launch itself is sold by Arians, the commercial offshoot. So we have a, there is an agreement in place, of course, where we have an ESA spacecraft. You know, these were developed by ESA, so we we get like a like an ESA rate, so to speak. So we have a we have a deal whereby we launch so many scientific spacecraft per year for costs uh, that are agreed pretty much uh, at a very high level. So, yeah. so it's it's of course it's easier for us to launch things than say uh, someone that doesn't have uh, background or 
was trying to, to negotiate with RNs Bus for the first time. Of course, we have these agreements in place, which makes it quite easy for ESA to, to agree upon a launch. Yes, of course, it's quite a complicated arrangement with you. Canares and RNs Fast, the commercial arm. So, like I said, we have these agreements in place. Any other questions? How much ESA is involved with the Skylon project? Skylon, oh, that's an interesting one. Uh, I believe they, they, they ran a study. Uh, they did a feasibility study. So, uh, but beyond that, I think our, our, our uh, involvement is quite limited. So ESA basically validated their concept, but the, the, the full project itself doesn't, I think, doesn't receive a massive amount of ESA funding apart from that initial study. That's what I'm, I'm not an expert in this uh, area, but that's what I've heard from my colleagues, that ESO ran this initial phase study to show that the concept was valid and their, their engine design, I think, was, was, was good. But the actual, the rest of the project, the actual construct, construction of the plane, the space plane, uh, this time, I'm not sure. They might be directly funded by the British government in some respects, I believe. They might come to ESA for funding in the future. But off the top of my head, I'm not, I'm not familiar with any current projects with Skull, apart from the initial study. Um, when you're trying to manage your control projects leading up to 2030, for instance, how do you how do you sort of manage those resources? Because especially in technology development as it is now, resources change value and productivity so quickly. So how do you start managing these type of very, very future range projects? It's an interesting question. There's a lot of Educated guesswork. Right. Uh, we, we of course use our history, our uh, heritage, very much as a as a grounds for how long a technology takes to develop. But of course, technology development is so erratic sometimes. We have we typically ask all technology developments to happen over a 12 month to 24 month period. But of course, you can't put something in those slots and it just works. They have a plan. The companies we of course rely upon the companies to tell us. Well, you've asked something that's 24 months long, and it's going to take us three years. Of course, we use them and then we adjust our planning accordingly. Yeah, it, 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 we do rely a lot upon our heritage in terms of our experience. You can see there's a long 50-year history of uh, developing missions. So, uh, and for me personally, like I do, what's called financial escalation, which is of course just inflation. So I, I count the costs over time. I have to try and predict staff movements. And I know to a certain extent some of those some of that information i uh i know roughly how many hours from our experience it costs to operate a mission i get my guys in uh, esop the space operations center they tell me how many hours and i know we have fairly standard rates about how much a person costs for instance so the esa cost to developing a mission a lot of it, of course is our expertise the actual hardware costs and the technology at the moment is only a it's a it's a quite a a large fraction, but it's certainly not the entire. So when I say 50 million, say a small mission, of course, a portion of that is the actual spacecraft. Some of it's the launch. Uh, there's a large portion which relates to the project team, which in case of the Cubes is quite a small team. It's only like sort of five permanent staff. And then we draw upon the technical expertise of all those other people, but they're not permanent. So I just pay for portions of uh, expertise. Um. Your agency itself has its own programs that are mandatory for countries to contribute to and be part Just of. Just the science program is mandatory. Um, the original ideas and concepts for these programs, where do they come from? Who makes them? And then how do you finally decide this program is not going to go past paper, but this one is? It's an interesting question. It depends on the program. Uh, because everyone, all the programs are governed by a program board. So we have various councils. The council is the over, overall gov governing body of the agency. But then every program, say science, telecoms, uh, human space flight, they have their own program board. So are these made by people in this organization or by individual countries that then present It can them? happen either way. So for instance, ESA can propose something. Uh, but for where I currently work, for instance, uh, we very much rely upon the scientific community. So we have several groups of scientists, they're typically prominent scientists from institutions around Europe, uh, professors, researchers, uh, they sit on, uh, there's typically, there's two scientific bodies, we have like a, 
like a space working group, as well as an astronomy group, uh, a space science group. They meet. Uh, they often they are look, they are often the ones who submit the uh, the, uh, the proposals for a mission. Uh, uh, the their universities. So we get these. I think I mentioned the the proposal for a mission from my science, which they can come from anyone. But of course, they get looked at. Uh, ESA tends to evaluate them, and then we take, for instance, the shortlist back to our program boards to say, okay, we have this shortlist of missions. Uh, they, they, of course, rely upon the agency to, to work out uh, cost-wise, does it make sense, is it within the budget? Uh, Science-wise, are, are we getting enough science out of this to make it worthwhile? So, for instance, if it's only benefiting like one scientist in one country, of course, no one's going to say, well, it's not going to spend it. 500 million euros on a mission that only benefits a very small group. So they try to, you know, to balance, uh, looking at the, the scientific return, uh, who's going to, what's of most interest in terms of what's, fee what's technically feasible, what's within the financial envelope, um, what's scientifically interesting to the European scientific community. Final decisions are normally ba made by the program boards based upon an ESA recommendation. Uh, where I used to work in telecoms, for instance, uh, some of the missions are proposed by industry, for instance, so which is a much more commercially driven uh, area. So often, Euro European industry will come to us saying, we want to do this in cooperation with ESA. So there it works a little bit differently. Regarding procurement, um, is that the needs of European industry for these programs? Typically, yes. There are, you can procure something outside the uh, European uh, member states, but normally you require certain levels of approval above, above the balance. So does that mean that right? Sorry? I mean, oh, no, of course. It's a multinational company. Yes. I mean, how, how does that, uh, what are the... Yes. So, there are, for instance, for space oh, procurements, like spacecraft, of course, right. there are, most of, they're built by the European Prime spacecraft contractors, of which there's only a small number of Airbus and Talos in space. But, of course, they're, not everything can be manufactured inside Europe. So, there, is a, there are levels which determine, yes, a certain amount of components. Uh, have to be exported from the US, for instance. So we, of course, we get high type issues. Uh, but of course, as long as you do all the paperwork, it's normally fine. And like I said, there's lim up to limits. Like, for instance, buying Windows for a computer, that's not important. But of course, if you wanted to buy a spacecraft and 90% of it was built in, in the US, of course, then, then we would have a problem. And where would I find those guidelines or conditions? Probably buried somewhere in the East. Uh, website <laughs> but, uh, but for small research activities uh, the, the, the limit because it's a large company just said, our limits are quite high so for small research activities uh, the actual limits I, I don't know off the top of my head most of my work is focused on the European industry and for instance when we have ITA issues we uh, the spacecraft contractors of course it's their primary responsibility to make sure that they can deliver us a spacecraft that we can launch. So it's a, yeah, you always come across political issues like this, uh, export control, even France has its own export control rules. So we're launching from French territory, but of course we have to transit through somewhere else. We have need all your paperwork stamps. Any further questions? Thanks very much. Thank you. I hope it was interesting. Uh, yeah, I, I tried to pick up as much of the technical aspects of things while I work. Uh,